everyone for joining us today. Um, the lecture we have today in this series is Pediatric Brain Cancers as Epigenetic Diseases. Uh, it's being presented by Stephen Mack. Thank you very much, Stephen, for, for presenting here today. He's an assistant professor at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. And his team studies a variety of high-risk brain tumors to understand the role of deregulated epigenomes as drivers of cancer. Stephen is also a recipient of one of Alex's Lemonade's most prestigious grants, um, and it's an ALSFA award, which he received in 2018. Dr. Mack's lecture will discuss developments in our understanding of chromatin regulation as drivers of pediatric brain cancers and therapeutic vulnerabilities. This is the fourth lecture in this virtual series. We have many more lectures scheduled in the coming weeks and months. If you'd like to be notified or see the topics of upcoming lectures, we'll put a link into the chat where you can see those or you can sign up to be notified um, when new lectures are announced. We're also gonna put a survey link in the chat so you can recommend topics and speakers for future lectures in this series. Finally, if you have questions for Stephen, put them into the chat and we will have them answered at the end. Thank you very much and we appreciate you coming here today, Stephen, and everyone for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and thank you everyone for joining me for this lecture at lunchtime. Let me go to my screen. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, we can. Great. Uh, thanks again to Jay, Alex Lemonade Stand for um, supporting our research throughout the years and this opportunity to present today. Um, I'll be talking about pediatric brain tumors, as, as I said, mentioned in my title, epigenetic diseases. Uh, more specifically, how they are fundamentally distinct from um, how we think about adult cancers. And in this slide showing, this is one of the first concepts that I learned when I was, uh, took a first, one of my first classes in, in epigenetic, in genetics, the genetic basis of cancer, showing how um, in the case of colorectal cancer, you can have a normal um, epithelium um, in, a, um, in a colon crypt here and showing how through accumulation of numerous mutations and increase in genomic instability, um, you can transform a cell shown in purple um, to this teal one shown in um, I'm representing cancer here. So the thought was is that if you identify all the mutations within a specific tumor or cancer type, you'd be able to learn more about the mechanisms driving that specific tumor in terms of initiation. Um, and also what are the specific driver events that are maintaining the tumors that could be potentially uh, druggable? And what are the different alterations that are associated with therapeutic resistance? And this led to large scale efforts by numerous consortia to catalog the different mutations, um, DNA alterations in cancer. And this is largely, um, this was largely um, to work towards an effort to develop personalized cancer therapy. And what I mean by this is that say you have a patient A with a specific tumor mutation, you could potentially match this gene mutation with a drug targeting um, this specific protein. And this is also true for a patient B with a different alteration that you may be able to pair with a specific drug B. And in order to develop more safer, more effective therapies, um, versus conventional drugs that are used potentially in children, which have a lot of cytotoxic um, effects. And there's been tremendous success, success in this area, um, largely looking at proteins at the cell surface, many of them representing uh, kinase proteins. Um, number one, because these were largely accessible at the cell surface, and many of these were enzymes. So we, we had experience in designing small molecules and fitting molecules within these specific proteins for inhibition, such as inhibition of EGFR signaling pathways, HER2 and breast cancer, um, track receptor signaling, and a variety of cancers. And I'll just highlight one of these success stories or early success stories in the case of personalized um, targeted therapy in the case of tumors with um, recurrent fusions of the TRAC receptor here. Just one second. The TRAC receptor. And what this pathway is, it's an oncogenic pathway driving proliferation and cell survival. But um, small molecules have been developed against these specific fusions. And what I wanted to highlight in this right panel here are, is number one, the response or the decrease in tumor size 
for in response to this therapy, but also shown in the different colors are the different entities or tumor entities in which they were seeing response because they have the same specific driver. And then this is really exciting, and there's been additional examples, particularly in low-grade gliomas um, using MAP kinase inhibitors. Um, but what, what was one of the challenge, one of the challenges that emerged when an, analyzing a lot of these large-scale sequencing cohorts by many groups is that compared to adult cancers shown in right, pediatric tumors had very low, relatively low mutation rates, and these are um, number of mutations per megabase here as shown in the left. So this posed a challenge in terms of uh, the number of targets that we could, um, effective targets that we could um, drug in terms of a specific therapy. And one of the other challenges that we had was many of these proteins that were recurrently mutated weren't our typical receptor tyrosine kinases that were on the surface. They weren't proteins that we already had drugs for. These were many of these targets that were recurrently mutated we're an emerging class of epigenetic regulators. And what do I mean by epigenetics? So if you think of gen genetics as the DNA code, um, epigenetics for the purposes of this talk, although I'm quite simplifying this, is that these are the proteins that are regulating the transcription or the activation of these genes. And this occurs through multiple layers of modifications, proteins that bind this DNA, proteins that wrap DNA, this DNA, and generally how it's folded within the nucleus. Now turning to normal development, the, the way I think about this is that every single cell in your body has the same DNA genome or genetic code, but you have hundreds of thousands of, of different cell types. And this is all governed by different transcriptional programs and diff governed by different transcriptional programs and regulated by um, different epigenetic mechanistic pathways. Um, so, for example, this is what distinguishes a kidney cell from a pancreatic cell, um, from a colorectal cell, from a brain cell. And there are numerous levels of this epigenetic regulation. So if you imagine here, uh, within every cell, you have a two-meter piece of DNA that needs to be compressed within a small nucleus that's less than 0 0.006 um, millimeters wide. And this has to be tightly regulated, and the DNA itself can be modified with the addition of, let's say, methyl groups shown in black here. This DNA is further associated with proteins known as histone proteins, and it's wrapped here in these nucleosomes. And these actual histone proteins can be uh, modified themselves. So I, the way I like to think about this is um, these add flags that indicate whether a gene could be expressed or repressed. And for the purposes of this talk, when I mentioned we're gonna focus on a lysine 27 um, histone 3 lysine 27 residue here that when it's acetylated, or we'll be referring to it as activated, and when it's methylated, it's repressed. Um, but several of these regions can be further um, organized into neighborhoods. So the blue neighborhoods here containing these genes don't physically interact with these red neighborhoods shown here. And these are further organized uh, within the cell within the nucleus. So this is a highly intricate process of gene regulation known as epigenetics. Now, developmental biologists have been interested in this and studying it for some time. And so as shown here, let's say, for example, a genes that it's ex expressed and enhanced regions that are located further away from this gene. And remember that DNA is not existing as a single line, but it's actually physically folded. So these regions are potentially interacting with this gene here. And what they're doing is recruiting proteins known as transcription factors that can govern gene expression, govern when, when a gene is expressed, where is it expressed, and these processes are critical for organismal uh, development. Now in pediatric cancers, as I mentioned before, these are in, what was found from many of these large scale sequencing studies is that there's an enrichment in mutations of epigenetic regulators. And I know this is a busy slide, but how I like to think about it is in terms of open chromatin, so actively transcribed regions of the genome that are driving oncogene expression. These are genes important for driving, let's say, cell proliferation and tumor growth. These are regulated by proteins, as I mentioned, transcription factors, let's say, that are activating these specific regions. And these are associated with um, active chromatin marks, such as lysine 27 acetylation. 
Conversely, there's regions of closed chromatin, which are silencing tumor suppressor genes. So genes involved in inhibition of cell growth and tumor formation. And what, what I wanted to highlight from this is many of these epigenetic proteins that regulate these processes in terms of activating gene expression or repressing um, genes, many of these epigenetic modifiers are mutated in pediatric brain tumors. MLL2 and 3 in mesoblastoma, SETD2 mutations in pediatric glioma. The histone mutations themselves, and I'll get into this further in the talk, they're mutated at that lysine 27 residue. Um, and these govern or are thought to contribute to aberrant gene expression programs within that, uh, that are involved in brain tumor genesis, pediatric brain tumor genesis. So as I mentioned before, I like to think of these modifications as on or off switch. And many of them, many people like to refer them as a dimmer to turn a gene expression on or off. But I like to think of it as one of these smart lights in terms of these proteins regulating when a gene's expressed, how much is it expressed, and where is it expressed. So this is a highly coordinated process that gets aberrantly regulated or deregulated in the case of pediatric cancer. So one of the central um, focuses in my lab is on cancer epigenetics and the role of epigenetics and cell identity. And this, as I mentioned before, is contributed through genetics, but there's other all, um, factors that contribute to epigenetic programs such as metabolic factors, what are the nutrients available to cells, microenvironmental factors, what are the cell-cell interactions between tumor cells and other cells in the microenvironment. And in normal development, um, these programs regulate, let's say, a neural stem cell and how it changes or differentiates um, to a neuron or a glial cell. But these programs are also actively involved in transformation from a neural stem cell, a more differentiated cell, to a brain tumor cell. And there's also heterogeneity within these specific programs that distinguish, um, distinguish between types of brain tumor cells and their tumorigenicity. So for the purposes of this talk, I like to highlight the role of epigenetics and their important contribution to pediatric brain tumors. And I'll do this through a couple examples. Um, the first one highlighting the application and utility of learning about epigenetics and applying this um, to study and diagnose pediatric brain tumors what mechanistic insights we can learn from studying the tumor epigenome in pediatric brain cancers, how these processes initiate tumor genesis, and whether we can derive any therapeutic vulnerabilities from learning about the tumor epigenome with a focus on pediatric brain cancer. So the first topic I'd like to highlight is DNA methylation, a modification that I mentioned earlier to DNA as an effective molecular classification tool. Now my lab studies a variety of pediatric high-risk brain tumors. And one of these is a penomoma, and I'll, I'll use this as um, I'm working through some of the examples in this lecture. But initially, a pen, so penomoma, it's the third most common pediatric brain tumor. Um, and it arises commonly in infants, but also can occur in adults. It arises all across the entire neuroaxis. And the key thing for a penomoma is that, especially, particularly in children, um, these are highly aggressive tumors. Um, they're treated by surgery and radiation, which has significant long-term um, neurologic side effects. And there's a desperate need to develop, to learn more about this particular brain tumor to devise um, targeted, more effective therapies. Now, when I first started learning about a penomoma in Michael Taylor's lab in Toronto, um, this is what we knew about it. It was divided into various histological grades, grade one versus grade two and grade three. Grade one tumors, as you can see here, have very distinct um, morphological features. Um, but what was the challenge was distinguishing between what was the role of um, histopathological grading in terms of assessing which were the more aggressive tumors um, for the ones that were more less aggressive. And this was a challenge um, that was particularly uh, problematic for the field in that we couldn't agree on any consistent criteria um, to grade these tumors. Um, so when we, so what was performed, or what was, what we turned to in the field, and this is performed by numerous groups now, is that despite histological similarity, penomomas, when we profile them using DNA methylation profiling here, what, they ended, what this indicated to us is that penomoma, although histologically similar, these tumors are broken down into at least nine different molecular subtypes. 
as shown with these different colors here. And I'll get into more detail about this after. But these histologically similar tumors that look very similar in the microscope have very different molecular biology. Now, this, this work was greatly expanded by Stefan Pfister's group, in which they've created a DNA methylation atlas of all brain tumors. And you can see here a penomomas, um, which are forming each of these different islands here representing a different uh, tumor subtype. So you could see rally driven epenomomas here are different from PFA, epenomomas, and PFB. Um, but what they wanted to highlight from this study is that this is a simplified map, but there are potentially hundreds of different um, rare pediatric brain tumor types. And the, uh, the additional thing is that these molecular profiles could be used to predict an unknown sample. So if you had a brain tumor specimen um, that you're interested in what subtype this could be, you could use this data to objectively predict, predict uh, with confidence um, or a confidence score of what that particular brain tumor type or classification is. And the next topic I'd like to highlight is epigenetic programs and cellular identity as therapeutic vulnerabilities. And as I mentioned before, one of the challenges that when we are sequencing a lot of these tumors is that we didn't identify clear drivers that we could pair with a specific drug. So what do you do in these cases? And what can we learn about what makes an epenomoma cell an epenomoma cell? And can this be leveraged for a particular therapy? And what we turned to as part of our ALSF project was looking at specific genes that were highly expressed within a penomoma and that were governed by super enhancers. And these um, super enhancers are specific regions of the genome that are governed by an intricate interplay between specific transcription factors. And these regions are heavily acetylated, so K27 acetylated, and this is an active mark associated with increase in transcription of these oncogenes, or in many cases, these super enhancers um, are known to identify genes important in maintaining or, or defining cell state. So shown in these two different courts, we identified these super enhancers that were present in a penomoma. But what we learned from these was the intricate uh, transcription factors that were regulating these specific regions that were binding to these regions and many of these transcription factors that were highly active as shown in red um, are involved in normal development in gliogenesis. In an RNAi or loss of function screen what we found is that many of these transcription factors that are potentially governing a penomoma cell identity are highly essential for cell growth as shown here and within the specific screen. So these what this indicated to us is that these particular proteins that are important or critical for maintaining a penomoma cell identity are required for, for proliferation or growth of these specific tumor types. The next I'd like to highlight the mutation of an epigenetic regulator as the first event in pediatric brain cancer. Now one example of this is, in, is seen in pediatric high-grade glioma in which there's a mutation of the, the actual histone proteins themselves. So as I mentioned that these histones can be modified and at this lysine 27 position, you have mutation of this histone to a methionine. And what this does is it blocks the PRC2 complex. So effectively blocking the repressive mark or the off switch. So the next question, um, the next thought is what are the active genes or what are the genes that are being um, increase in terms of transcription as a result of the loss of this repressive um, signaling. And what's also important to mention is that these specific histone mutations as the first event are subsequently accompanied by other mutations such as TP53 mutations, HRX mutations, PDGF receptor alpha or amplifications. Now what we had shown with Nanda Shibata was that these uh, mutations are associated with widespread um, accompanying epigenetic alterations. And just to take a step back, what we learned was that um, in normal, so in normal cell development, your cells have um, two thirds of your genome is comprised of endogenous retrovirus or repeat elements. And these are normally silenced through evolution. But what occurs in the context of these, of this mutation is that you have aberrant activation of many of these repeat elements. So the expression of many of these endogenous retroviral elements that are normally silenced uh, within each of your cell types. Now your cells have an inherent mechanism for responding to infection, so RNA-encoded viruses, 
Um, and in this case, this represented a potential therapeutic vulnerability in that you have cells with these specific mutations could potentially leverage this by increasing levels of these retroviral elements so that cells undergo what's known as a process called viral mimicry. So they think they're, they're virally infected and respond um, by upregulating an interferon um, pathway to respond against these sequences. And we had shown with NADA that this represents a potential therapeutic epigenetic vulnerability in that tumor cells with this specific mutations can be further treated with these epigenetic inhibitors to further increase these levels of endogenous retroviruses as compared to a knockout control, demonstrating that this is a potential sensitivity to these specific inhibitors um, and is associated with a specific mutation in this histone protein. What about mutation of an epigenetic regulator as the only event in cancer? And there's a good example of this, not only in pediatric epidemol, but many other solid um, tumors in pediatrics, such as EWS fly one driven, Ewing sarcoma, Pax3 FOXO1 fusions, and rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, but we, uh, we study a variant of a penomoma known as CLF North uh, supernatorial penomoma, that is a penomoma of the cortex. And these over 72% of these tumors are driven by the CLF North 95 relay fusion. And this is identified by Richard Gilberton's group and David Ellison. So this is a fusion between an uncharacterized protein called CLF North 95, chromosome 11, open reading frame 95, with the well-characterized RELA pathway that's been shown to be involved in inflammation and cancer. What this fusion does is it traps or drives this specific protein into the nucleus. And what's important to, um, what I'd like to convey here is that this fusion alone is sufficient to driving tumor genesis. So I say, to compare this against many of the adult tumors that I alluded to in the beginning of the talk, this is a fusion, one event that's sufficient when driven in a specific neural stem cell or neural cell type that can cause cancer. And this is shown here in the mice that are um, developed penomoma-like tumors that are driven by this specific alteration. And we had, we had also shown this in using other approaches um, in collaboration with Ben Denine, um, in which we overexpressed this specific fusion in utero during development, brain development, we're able to generate these tumors. This fusion is able to localize to specific regions of the genome, as shown by um, chip seek or cut and run of this specific fusion. And it's associated with the acquisition of active chromosomes. So these, these activate specific regions of the genome that are driving specific oncogenes such as FRMB2, cyclin D1, that are known drivers of epenomoma. And the last example I'd like to give are, is um, the case that epigenomic alterations may be occurring in pediatric brain cancer, may be drivers without accompanying DNA mutations. And we had first, um, we were first of all, were studying this in the context of sequencing of penomoma by whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. And what was immediately apparent about these tumors as compared to adult, let's say adult lung cancer genomes, is that there's many different alterations in lung cancer, a few uh, recurrent rearrangements, copy number alterations, recurrent mutations. But this is what we saw for a large number of infant posterior fossa penomomas, that is the penomomas that are arising in the cerebellum and brainstem, is that it's almost like we sequence the normal genome here, that there's a lack of recurrent mutations, there's a lack of recurrent rearrangements or copy number alterations. Um, and penomomas have a very low mutation rate. Now what was shown by um, David Ellison's group was that these specific tumors have overexpression of a gene known as CX or 67. And in about 10% of cases it's mutated, but in 90% of cases it's overexpressed. And this protein is, acts as a mimic of the K27M mutation, as I, as I alluded to in earlier slides. But the overexpression of this particular protein is sufficient to turn off that repressive mark, drive down K27 trimethylation. And this specific epigenetic phenotype we see in pediatric glioma, it's a hallmark of a PFA epenomoma, including pediatric glioma, um, that are driven by the K27M mutation. But the difference between gliomas and epenomomas that these are accompanied, as I mentioned before, with additional alterations, additional mutations. And many epenomomas that we see, PFA epenomomas, have overexpression of this 
CX467 protein or the EZH2 interacting protein is sufficient to drive down K27 trimethylation levels or loss of the off switch um, to activate gene expression programs. And that's often the only thing we see in these specific tumors. So the last thing I'd like to leave with the thought is that epigenetic programs play a critical role in dif um, differentiating different cell types in the body, let's say neural stem cells from neurons, glial cells. Um, but who's to say that specific epigenetic programs could be play a primary role in driving tumor genesis in the case of pediatric brain tumors? Um, I think there's a lot more work to be done. And perhaps we haven't identified a cryptic genetic alterations yet in these PFA driven tumors. But I, what I'd like to highlight in this final slide is that shown in this, the inner circle, the different discoveries we've made using DNA based approaches, discovering drivers of many different pediatric cancers and how these are making their way in the clinic as shown in the outer circle. I think there's a lot more discovery to be done in terms of learning about the role of epigenetic programs in a variety of pediatric cancers, not only brain tumors. And these have important ramifications in terms of new technologies that we can bring to the clinic, such as DNA methylation in the case of pediatric brain tumors. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my team and all my collaborators and our funding agencies, Alex Lemonade Stand, for giving me this great opportunity to present today. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. That was, that was a great lecture. Um, at this time, we, um, we're willing to take some questions. You can just type them into the chat if people have questions. We'll give it just a minute uh, to see if we get some questions in, Stephen. Looks like somebody, somebody has their hand raised. When I tried to do it last time, they had themselves muted so it didn't come out. But I can't figure out how to click on it today. Jen, are you able to? Okay, here we go. I'm going to start reading these. <clears throat> um, from Hassan Uladag, how likely is it to develop a drug for rare brain tumors? Um, that's a great question. I think that um, as we study these brain tumors more and divide them into different subtypes, we see these specific alterations, let's say the C11 North 95 rel A fusion that's seen specifically um, in a subtype of a penomoma. I think that um, in terms of partnership with industry, I think that there's potential there to develop um, specific um, molecules for this specific protein. I think that the good, what I think that I'd like to focus on is that we have a target, we have a specific driver, so we can isolate the patients if we had a specific drug um, that we could be that we could leverage for that um, particular tumor type, um, I, but I think that it's, it requires partnership not only from academia in terms of the initial development of this, um, but partnership with um, um, other groups as well, including including industry to take this actual to an actual development of a specific drug. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Jerome Fortin. Uh, his question is related to DNA methylation. Do you think it's useful only as a classifier of tumors or does it drive certain aspects of tumor genesis? Um, that's a great question. I mean, initially when we were profiling DNA methylation, we had our, pro, our, our thought at that time was that, or at least the feel is that when you have hypermethylation of genes, it's associated with gene silencing. And I think that's true for, for some cases where you have repression of tumor suppressor genes um, but I think that in many cases, the utility of it is to use it as a marker. I think that in the case of pediatric brain tumors or even sarcomas, it's a reflection of the patterns that are present in the cells that give rise to these tumors. Um, and it has power in terms of use as molecular diagnostics. Um, I think that there's also potential for um, utilizing specific inhibitors of these um, DNA methyltransferases in cases um, for in, in, as a specific therapy and for inhibiting these specific programs, such as these um, endogenous retroviral element um, um, upregulation that we see in uh, subsets of these hybrid gliomas and epinomomas, for example. Thank you, Steve. Um, the next question comes from Genevieve Kendall, and Genevieve is giving our next talk, actually, on Friday about um, 
using zebrafish models in pediatric sarcomas. So don't forget to sign up for that one. But Genevieve says it was a great talk. Um, in your data, CXORF67 is also overexpressed in germ cell tumors. Do you see a similar mechanism of action at play in that context? We haven't looked at that specifically. That's a great question. Um, we have a few lines that I think we were thinking about looking at. There's a recent paper showing that CXORF67 is overexpressed in germ cells. So I think that it's, it's very likely that um, we'd see similar mechanisms there. Okay, uh, sorry, I was muted. Um, is there gen the next question is from UCLA and it says, is there genetically engineered mouse models for ependymomas that could be used for drug screening? Um, there's a variety of genetically engineered, there's number one patient derived xenograft models that are available. Um, but there's increasingly more and more genetically engineered mouse models of supratentorial ependymomas, particularly driven by the RELA or YAP1 fusion. Um, that could be used for drug screening in the context of, so number one, you'd be able to grow those cells to screen them in vitro, and you'd have an immune competent model um, that you could test these specific therapies in vivo. Uh, PFA ependymoma models, um, I think we're limited to PDX models currently as there hasn't been a, a genetically engineered um, mouse model for PFA ependymoma as of yet. The next question is from Gustavo, and his question is for EP1NS RELA fusion line culture. It was performed under NS conditions or attached conditions. And follow up, does it alter the epigenetic K27 AC signature? So that's a great question. So one, one, one of the challenges when we are growing some of these lines and cultures that we're growing them um, um, in, a, in addition, how representative is that of the actual in vivo environment and how reflective is that of the primary patient tumor? In the case of EP1S, when we've profiled it by DNA methylation profiling, K27 acetylation profiling, and we've compared it against the primary tumors, um, it retains that epigenetic signature surprisingly quite well. Um, I'm not sure if, if there's other aspects that uh, make it different, but at least looking at those two um, signatures would indicate to us that um, it's, it's, it reflects at least some of the biology of the actual primary patient specimen. Okay, and the next question is from Andrea, I'm not sure, Punti, uh, says fantastic talk, and her question is about CXORF67 and H3K27M. And the question is, do you believe that loss of H3K27 ME3 is the main route through which the, these proteins drive tumor genesis? I think that's a great question. I think in, I mean, I think that in the case of PFA epenomoma, these tumors typically have very silent genomes. They're frequently devoid of copy number alterations. Um, CXORF67 and their mutation overexpression is it's one of the only things that at least we've detected so far in these specific tumors. Um, do I think it's a, a major driver in the case of PFA penalm? I, I think quite possibly. I think that, I think that we could possibly, we could probably test that in some of our, our models as well. Um, in the case of pediatric high-grade glioma, I think that given that there's accompanying mutations, um, that would suggest that there are additional hits. But the problem with, I think, PFA penalm is that I don't know what those additional hits would be. I don't know what all these uh, letters and numbers mean. I'm glad you do. <laughs> At least I, I think I do. <laughs> okay. So the next question comes from Bernard Englinger, and he's also said it was a great talk. And he said, what is your, th what is your thought that one expression of non-canonical NFKB target genes in RELA EPN? Um, so I think that's a great question. I think that 
from our data, what we found what we found is that there are, and this is in line with Richard uh, Richard Gilbertson's work, in that there are there is a shared program of canonical relay target genes that are overexpressed, um, but there is a distinct signature gene expression signature, and of and these are bound by the actual fusion itself. So I think that connecting CLEV North ninety five with relay um, confers a novel gene expression program. Um, that's different from hyperactive relay signaling. And I'll, and also add to that is that um, Eric Coughlin has shown that when you hyperactivate, when you drive expression of hyperactive uh, relay, that's not sufficient to drive tumor genesis in mice. So it suggests that there's something additional, something added that C11 North 95 is providing. Okay. Um, next question is, how does your group plan to handle issues with testing ICI strategies in combination with HDAC inhibitors in the absence of a genetic mouse model with an, in, an intact immune system? Um, that's, a great, that's a great question. I think that we're transitioning, I mean, we're transitioning now from a lot of our PDX models, given that we are exploring the role of immune cell recruitment into immune competent genetic models. And, and I think this is where a lot of our efforts in terms of in utero electroporation approaches are, are at play here or um, in, in application that we can use that specific mouse model. Um, probably can't do it for PFA and penomoma, but I think that, that we could test that potential strategy in the case of um, pediatric high-grade glioma with that specific histone mutation. So, uh, the next question comes from Brian Na, and it's a multi-part question. It's pretty long. So I'm going to give it a chance to, to read it to you, Stephen. Um, and he says, what do you think about the role of the epigenetic modifying agents, such as uh, uh, EZH2 inhibitor? For example, tazimetastat is now in phase two studies within the COG match, but a recent paper on ATRT out of Heidelberg shows that EZH2 and H3K27, ME3, and EZH2, um, I guess, positive and negative, which suggests that an EZH2 inhibitor could, in fact, may have a paradoxical effect, although the phase one trial was promising. So what do you think the next steps would be uh, for that? Uh, I think that's a great question. If I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, I think that um, given the evidence out there that it's K27 trimethylation. There's different ways of tackling it. You can um, restore K27 trimethylation levels, but one approach is that even though there's a global loss, we see a global loss of K27 trimethylation, um, it's retained at specific sites, and it's thought that these sites are to be important for repression of tumor suppressor genes. So there's a thought that that retention of that small amount of K27 trimethylation could be driven down further as a therapeutic vulnerability with ECH2 inhibitors. So I think that it's, there's potential there. And I think that there's, um, there's rationale for at least testing this in preclinical models um, that are, that have this um, epigenetic phenotype of low K27 trimethylation. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, next question also says, great talk, um, Dr. Mack. Have you looked at the epigenetic profile of non-RELA fusion ependymomas, for example, the YAP1 fusion tumors? Um, we haven't looked at them directly, but I think that, I mean, that's a great question as to um, how we compare the fusion-driven transcriptional programs with RELA to YAP1. Um, for those of you in the audience, YAP1, um, which I didn't discuss uh, in this particular talk, it drives a particular subtype of ependymoma um, that's distinct from RELA, um, but it'd be interesting to see what are the commonalities between C11 North 95 RELA driven um, tumors and YAP1 fusion driven tumors, particularly C11 North 95 YAP1 driven uh, penomomas. Okay, the next one comes from David Chen, and he asks Is there a cell model of a penomoma available to lentiviral based CRISPR genetic screen for looking for new uh, therapeutic targets in this disease? Um, that's a great question, David. I think that there's a numerous um, PDX models that are becoming available now, for particularly in for rally-driven ependymoma and also PFA ependymoma. Um, I think that 
and we have a collection of models here that we're happy to share with anyone who's listening here. Um, Cause I think that there's, I mean, I think that it's a good, it's a good idea for us to do these large genome wide screens for looking at potential vulnerabilities or even in a focused manner, looking at epigenetic vulnerabilities in these specific tumor types. Okay, the next question comes from Anna Green, our good friend. And she asks, why is ependymoma chemo resistant and how will you overcome that when looking for new therapies? I think that's a great question. We don't, we don't fully understand um, why ependymomas are chemo resistant um, to my knowledge at the moment. I think that there's, there's numerous avenues for, for why that, that might be the case. Um, I think that exploring in terms of deep biology of what are the mechanisms driving that resistance, whether it be exporting um, drugs, uh, drug pumps exporting from the cell or, or other mechanisms. I think that it's worth exploring those areas. I think that there's other approaches in terms of looking at more specific targeted therapies. I, I know that some of um, our colleagues here are looking at um, HER2 expression on ependymoma cells as a potential vulnerability and targeting at ependymoma cells by virtue of high level expressions of HER2. So I think that both exploring the mechanisms of contributing to chemo resistance, but also looking at um, more targeted, more specific approaches, I think would be valuable as well. Well, we've reached the end of our question, Stephen. So um, I want to thank you again for doing this talk today. I want to thank you for everything that you do um, to help kids with cancer. We appreciate it. And um, I would just thank everyone for coming to this lecture today. If you look at the chat, there's a survey there that where you can give us feedback about how we're doing with uh, the lecture series and also recommend future speakers and future topics. So with that, uh, I'm going to call this lecture a success. And um, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.